I still love the chaos of everything. I love that every day is uh, is always a surprise. You're always going to have challenges and surprises that that need to be overcome. It sometimes looks like I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a bad time. I have a very serious expression on my face, but I, anyone who knows me knows that I, I actually just love it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Gaining the hunger for knowledge to succeed and create your own path is harder than it may seem on the surface. Opportunity, sacrifice and a willingness need to entwine to help create the best possible career path. But with determination and eyes wide open, the world of hospitality can offer it all. Cameron Tayap is the head chef of Amaru in Armadale, Melbourne. Cameron, how are you? Yeah, good. How are you, Huck? I'm good. It's great to get you on the show. You're manning the pans of, you know, one of the most exciting restaurants to open in, in recent years. What's it like? Oh, it's great. We're, we're having a good time. You know, every place has its challenges always, but um, we're really happy with what we're up to at the moment. It's it's really part of this new wave of um, of modern Australian that taps into extraordinary produce, but um, is giving voice to it in a way that we not, haven't necessarily seen before. What's that responsibility feel like for you? Look, I mean, there's uh, there's always a uh, a pressure that um, to try and make something new and different, especially nowadays. Um, but. I love it. I love the pressure. I love uh, the creativity that goes behind it, and really um, thinking about all of the uh, different produce that we that we've got on offer. Um, and we're just really lucky to have such great suppliers and farmers that we work with um, really closely that can uh, keep us up to date and um, really help to deliver an amazing product. The last couple of years have sort of turned all of our lives upside down. But how, how are things now in the dining landscape? What, what's the sense that you have for this year? I'm really excited about this year. We were quite fortunate coming out of lockdown. We were very busy and um, we had a quite, quite a busy uh, summer. Um, and it seems to be uh, going into quite a busy year, um, fingers crossed. Um but I guess it's really hard to predict what uh, what the climate and what um, what guests are feeling like at the moment, uh, especially as we also have the wine bar across the road called um, Oterra. Um, I guess for them, gauging uh, guests and predicting and forecasting um, how many people you're going to do each week is uh, it, it's very challenging. Is this uh, the the stability and um, Everything is just up and down. It's really hard to hard to see into the future at the moment. We've had many guests on the show talk about uh, a change in um, perception of their career and what they want to get out of hospitality. Are you noticing that from guests as well? Do you think there's a different perception of restaurants and what they want to get out of them? I don't know about the guests. I definitely see it in our industry as in general after – Going into lockdown, people have had time to reflect and um, time to really question things. Um, and sometimes, you know, that leads to people wanting to choose a different lifestyle. Um, so what I'm seeing generally is more of a, a career change or and a, a staff shortage, which we're definitely still seeing. Um, from a guest point of view, uh, I think in in the last couple of years, especially with uh, the media, um, the expectation of fine dining is becoming a, a lot higher uh, because everything is just becoming uh, more, I guess, uh, known. So it's harder to impress guests and the standards need to be a lot higher, which is really good. It definitely pushes us to, you know, uh, really push ourselves to make something new and to uh, you know, deliver amazing um, experiences, but it's it's definitely amped up the pressure a little bit. That's a really interesting insight. How about yourself? Have you have you approached your craft differently coming out of the last couple of years? Um, I don't know if I've approached it differently. I've always approached it with a very similar mindset of always just trying your best, and I guess like. The, the further you go on in, in your career, the more hours you put in, your best becomes better. So 
I wouldn't say that I've uh, I've I've changed the approach. I've maybe started thinking about food a little bit differently, and um, you know, placing more emphasis on showcasing great produce and not having to tamper with it too much. You know, especially when you're young, you think you you have all of these new techniques and new ideas, and you want to like mess around as much as you can. Whereas I think now, a lot of uh, a lot of skill and confidence comes from doing less and um, really letting ingredients shine. That's a real sign of maturity. And I want to get into your food and what you're doing at Amaru uh, shortly, but take us back to when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play in your family growing up? Um, it's actually kind of funny because, uh, you know, you, you listen to a lot of different uh, things and talking to a lot of people. A lot, a lot of chefs come from a really, like, food-driven family. They have all of these amazing uh, food and wine experiences that they they draw back on. But growing up, um, food was merely a necessity. Um, we moved we moved to Australia when I was about five years old from Malaysia, and uh, in Malaysia, you know, hawker hawker centres and food is very accessible. It's actually a lot cheaper to eat out than it is to cook at home. So, my mum. Uh, had to learn how to cook when she came to Australia. So my memory of food is not great. <laughs> she, uh, I, I do recall a, um, a time she tried to make lasagna and uh, she overcooked all of the lasagna sheets in milk um, and then also uh, had a very wet bolognese base. So it ended up cutting into it and it was like a, a soup. Um, so I do recall quite a few tragedies in the kitchen, but you know, um, we, 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 we've gone past that and, uh, she's now a much better cook, uh, and as am I, and, uh, we've, we've grown together to have some, uh, very great bonding moments over food in the last couple of years. With that sort of um, upbringing with food, how did you foster a connection and and think of food as a potential career? Yeah, it was uh, in VCE when I was in year eleven and year twelve. I, I was uh, we we grew up in a really large household and we always had um, guests staying with us, whether they were like international students or um, homestays stuff like that. Um, and we would, it was a very lively household. So there was always celebrations and birthdays happening. And one of the best ways that we, we, we could celebrate was to have dinner at home. Um, so I would bake cakes, um, for, for the whole family. And I, I found, uh, some sort of enjoyment in that. Um, but then going into VCE, I still wanted to pick subjects, which I enjoyed. So I, uh, I stumbled into vet hospitality, um, which was great. And there was another another kid in my year level who uh, who really showed me what fine dining was, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is pretty cool." And I'm very competitive, so he would beat me every single time in all of our assessments, um, in and out, in and out. And uh, one day we did an assessment where we had to research a few different restaurants, and I somehow managed to fall into the uh, San Pellegrino 50 best list and I was looking at Alinea um, which was uh, mind-blowing at the time um, and I, I, I fell into a really dark deep rabbit hole and I, I, I spent days and hours and hours researching everything that they did at Alinea uh, oh my god you know like I didn't realize food could be more than a uh, a source of uh, sustenance and nutrition. I didn't realize it could be so emotional and, you know, tell stories and really make people feel things. Um, and that's when I guess I started falling in love with the idea of uh, also trying to recreate experiences and um, really making our guests feel things. So that's when it, I first started thinking of uh, hospitality um as a career choice, I was really fortunate at the time. I had a lot of uh, great advice from people like uh, Caroline Velik and um, da uh, 
the guys at Birch and Purchase, Kath and uh, Darren, um, who are definitely uh, pushing me to choose something that I enjoy to do. Where did you uh, get your foot in the door? Tell us a little bit about the sort of beginnings of your career. Um, when I had first started, I wanted to learn from the best to be the best. That was my approach to my career. So at the time, I didn't want to move to Sydney. I was only 17. Um, and at the time, I heard of this restaurant called Attica, who were doing uh, some amazing things, uh, especially with native ingredients. So I was at, actually at TAFE and uh, William Anglis. And um, on my summer holidays, I wanted to find a, uh, a job placement. So I went uh, knocking on the back door of Attica. Um, I, I went three days because uh, the first time I got turned away, they said, yeah, sorry, chef's not in right now. Um, second day, same thing. And then third day, uh, yeah, uh, the sous chef at the time, Peter Gunn, came out, said hello to me, and then uh, we organized for me to come in for a, uh, a job placement. And I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. Take us, take us into that kitchen um, with Peter Gunn and obviously Ben Shuri as well. What was it like for you when you first started? It was kind of like a culture shock, you know. You go from high school where everything is kind of breezy and, you know, all you got to think about is going to school and exams. And then suddenly you're getting thrown into – a uh, kitchen and it is so fast, so intense. There's things happening all the time. And then it's like five o'clock and you're getting ready for service. It was, it was exciting. It was like a, it was like a roller coaster, and you know, thing, things were always happening. There was, it's like one of the things I love so much about the kitchen is like organized chaos, you know, like, um, and also lucky that team was I I incredible. You know, it was so much talent there at the time um and uh with pete at the at the at the helm as well you know really driving everyone to really push really hard um so it was um it was really exciting are there any sort of first food experiences that you had while working in that kitchen with ingredients you hadn't come across before you can tell us about um i was uh, uh everything was foreign to me you know like all of the native ingredients, I had no idea what I was looking at. And uh, I was following recipes, following instructions as, as much as I could, um, slowly starting to uh, understand things more and more. Uh, one of my first jobs, I remember, was portioning herbs. Um, so back then, they had the, uh, we had all of the gardens at Ripponley Estate where we would go and pick all the herbs every morning. And one of my jobs was to uh, portion herbs for the first part of my day. And, you know, I think there is a learning experiences in everything. So portioning out 40 different herbs, of course, you're tasting as you're going, really learning about different herbs when they're in season, when they're dying. And I can still call upon these, uh, these experiences now. And it's actually been a, quite a invaluable asset. Um, but really, I think I, I learned the most from people rather than uh, recipes or um, ingredients. Um, you know, a restaurant like uh, Attica had people coming from all over the world. So you're learning from everyone's experiences and it's this, this big pool of talent and, and knowledge. So as a determined 17-year-old, you know, you're soaking it all in as much as you can and it's – it can be quite overwhelming, but at the same time, it's like, wow, you know, there's just so much happening. We've had uh, Ben and Peter on the show um, previously. Um, what, do you have any stories of what it's like to work with them? Um, unfortunately, I only worked with Pete for about four to six months before he was heading up at IDES. Um, and back then, I was quite a timid young boy. Um, so I was, uh, I guess, intimidated by everyone. Um, but going, uh, going forward, um, I was very lucky to have a really great relationship with Ben. He, he played a, a huge role in who I've become. He's, uh, 
being a great role model, not just as a as a chef, but as a as a person. Um, you know, seeing how he is with his kids has always been quite ad- admirable. I've always looked up to him almost as like a like a father figure. You know, it's one of it's a very strange relationship where it is like professional, but at the same time a little bit personal. Um, so I have a very uh, we have a very special connection. Um, my mom has always been a big part of my career as well. So. Uh, she has a great relationship with Ben, uh, so much so that they had a they had a portrait of my mom in the uh, in the backyard uh, recently as as one of the Attica stories. Um, yeah, we used to do like staff meals, and she would bring things for the staff. So we we have a very personal connection to Attica and Ben. Is is there any staff meal or anything that you can tell us about those uh, experiences that your mom and you created there? Um. So. I remember a couple of Christmases ago, we did the Attica Christmas um, lunch and mum brought, I think it was curry puffs as her contribution and uh, for the staff Christmas. And then in lockdown, I was back at Attica helping out. They were just so busy with all of the takeaway. Um, and one night, we I was quite bored at home and, you know, it, it, there were long days doing the takeaway. So mum and I made some fried noodles, brought it over and kind of did our own takeaway from home and brought it in for all of the staff to take home with them. Um, And then one of the takeaway projects was the staff specials. And so the idea was for members of the uh, team to create a uh, a three-course menu, which they would sell um, based on their nationality so there was a French menu, there was a, a Korean menu, um, a Kiwi menu, and I did one as well, um, a Malaysian background. Um, but I did it with my mom. So we created a menu which was um, chicken ribs with satay, um, and then we did a curry laksa and a uh, coconut and uh, kaya tart. Um, and that was a really great bonding experience for us, uh, to actually be able to cook together. And, um, my mom's favorite dish is curry laksa. So that was, uh, really nice to get her recipe and, and then play around with it. You spent a lot of time traveling as well. Whenever you got holidays from Attica to tell us about some of the trips you've been on and stages you've done around the world and what impact they've had on you. Yeah. So, um, Attica, when I was there, we used to have like two to three weeks holidays every every year for Christmas. So I remember one year I went up to Sydney um, to do a whole heap of eating. So I went to Pillar and Sepia. And then one year I worked in the, in the gardens just to make sure that not everything died, which was quite challenging. I remember that year it was like a heat wave of one week of just 40 degrees every day and like things were just dying everywhere and I was um you know really trying my best to make sure to like water them do all the weeding you know keep everything uh manageable um and that was such a great learning experience for me as well uh it really gives you an appreciation for where vegetables come from it's hard work um and then one year I went to the states I left the night that we finished at Attica and I did a big eating journey all the way through from New York to Chicago to um, San Francisco. And I remember our uh, our flights from New York to San Francisco got uh, cancelled because there was a snowstorm. But unfortunately, I had a reservation at Alinea, which was like the be-all, end-all of everything at the time. So... (laughs) I literally got onto the last bus from New York to Chicago. It it was like a 22-hour bus drive, um, stopping through uh, Cleveland, and it was terrible. It was horrendous, cold, um, wet, but I managed to make it into Chicago. I didn't really have much internet, so I kind of had to figure out how to get to my friend's place who I was staying at. Um, just in time to make it to dinner that night. 
unfortunately my mom was quite ill so she stayed in new york um it was a journey it was wild uh but uh we got there in the end and yeah to this day it's been the most memorable dining experience i've ever had is is there an element of the dining experience or, or something that's lived with you um to make it that that you can tell us about i was just surprised how tasty everything was i was kind i was actually really nervous going in because i'd hyped it up in my mind for the last you know 10 years and i'm like it surely can't live up to my expectation you know because I've, I've never i've never been there i'd met grant and the alinea team when they were in melbourne for the 50 best <clears throat> And that was, I was already like starstruck, kind of like fan fanboying. And then you get to the restaurant and they really do just want to mess with you. So I remember the first, first course you enter the, into, enter the dining room and it's one really long communal table. And I was like, well, this is really weird. You know, it's kind of strange. So the lights were really dim and they give you the first course <clears throat> and it was um, a caviar dish. It was very tasty. And then they ask you to go to the kitchen. So we went to the kitchen and I had a couple of friends working there at the time. So I said hello to them. They gave us another cocktail and another dish in the kitchen and had a little chat and explained everything and then brought us back into the dining room where it was more warmly lit. And suddenly this like 10 meter long communal table is gone and everyone gets seated at their individual tables and it was like a magic trick. I was like, well, how do you get rid of a 10 meter long table without making that any noise or anything? I was like, kind of mind blown. And then after that, course after course, it's uh, really a sensory overload, you know, they play with the environment that you're sitting in, you know, the, the lights, the music, um, everything so it was it was it was a lot but it was amazing how did the gig at amaru came about um coming out of uh lockdown uh i had initially agreed to help a friend um reopen pinchies in the city it's like a seafood bar and uh at the same time the previous head chef of amaru richard had sent me a message and I said, sorry, I've literally just agreed to, um, to this gig and it would, it wouldn't be right to back, back out now. So I, I was at Pinchy's for a while. I was cooking seafood. I was enjoying it. Um, but after a while it was fun, but at the same time, it kind of left me wanting a little bit more. Um, so after six months, Richard had been continuously checking up, seeing if I was still enjoying it, seeing if I was bored yet. And eventually, um, I think it was after one really, really rough week. Um, I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come in for dinner at Amaru. I've been meaning to come back for a long time. So this will be a good excuse. Um, so me and my partner went in for dinner. We sat at the, at the chef's bar. Uh, the closest seats to the kitchen and pretty much from the get-go I was like oh I miss this so much I miss the you know all of their handmade crockery I miss the cutlery being changed every every round I miss the timing of dishes coming out like one after the other not just in chaos sending everything all at one time like I, I miss the the orchestration of the of the dining experience straight away and i was like yeah okay i'll come in for a trial pretty much in three days so three days later i was in for a trial and a week after that i was in the kitchen um and then um yeah richard had uh it was more of like a handover between richard and i and uh and here we are well, tell us a little bit about your food. Is there a dish or two on the menu at the moment you could tell us about that kind of exemplifies um, where you are? Um, well, I guess at the moment we're, you know, we're, we're, we still play around with native ingredients as well as just really nice locally sourced seasonal produce. Um, we are also trying to 
think a lot more sustainably. So I guess the best dish that exemplifies that is our um, second dessert, which is this dish of um, brioche, Davidson plum, and uh, blood lime. So we, we, we bake the uh, brioche in-house and then we turn it into this ice cream. Um, underneath it is a, a jam made from Davidson plums and blackberries. And all of the pulp that we uh, use or that we have as a byproduct gets used in our um, bar program. So we use the Davidson plum to turn into a, a non-alcoholic uh, umeshu or plum wine. And the blackberries we ferment and make into a blackberry soy, which we use to season. Uh, we, we, used, we used to use it to season octopus, but now we um, use it to season our uh, made in-house, like non-alcoholic red wine. Um, and then on top, originally we, we had yuzu uh, coming from mountain yuzu. Um, and we were using the juice and the zest, but all of this skin, we weren't doing anything with it. So... It was one lunch service that we weren't super busy. I took all of the uh, the peels and we um, really finally chopped it up and made it into a marmalade, which went on top of the uh, of the dessert and it worked so well. So from there, it went into this uh, ongoing process of using up leftover citruses. So it went from yuzus to bergamots to um, sunrise limes, kumquats, um, blood limes. So I guess um, in a way it, it's been this ever-changing, evolving dish. Um, it, get, it then gets finished off with this caramel made from um, leftover sourdough. So all of the uh, sourdough crust and crumbs, we, we keep it, we ferment it, turn it into this miso, and then the miso gets made into this caramel. Um, and... That's it. It's a, it's a really great way of thinking about our wastage and, you know, trying to repurpose a lot of um, what could be a waste. Um, and that's one of, I think it's one of the longest standing dishes on the current menu at the moment. We've had Clinton on the show as well. How do, how do you work with him? Is it a collaboration or do you have a full license to do what you do? <laughs> uh, it's it's not quite a full license. Uh, Clinton, it's very much a collaboration. Um, Amaru is very much Clinton's baby, um, as is Otera. Um, and I, I'm i very honored and privileged that he's, uh, he's trusted me to make sure that it doesn't burn down every day. Um, but that being said, we work quite well together. He um, he very much tastes everything. We have uh, quite regular meetings about produce and dishes, things that are coming into season, um, and what we would like to use, what we'd like to see on the menu, what we would like to change on the menu. And then I'll go away and make a whole bunch of different things and then hopefully some of them are really tasty and he will uh will have a tasting he'll taste some things which i think are pretty good and most of the time there'll be a couple of little tweaks um here and there but and then we go from there and you know everything can always be improved so we're always like tweaking things as we go improving things like the brioche dessert had like maybe five iterations before the current one and just, you know it, as is everything it's always an ongoing journey of how to improve the the overall experience and the and the food as well what surprised you about the role of head chef uh in a in a restaurant sort of breaking new ground in australia um well right now we have such a young team uh, of amazing individuals they're all super young super keen and eager so really stepping into this head chef role of now suddenly being the guy who is providing the guidance, the support, the almost like mentorship, um, it's been a big jump for me because um, I, I still I, I still have all of my mentors who I see quite frequently um, from the Attica days and by chatting with them, it's like I look back quite often and it's, I'm almost still kind of shocked that I'm in that role because um, it's come by so quickly and look like I'm, I'm really happy to be in that role and I'm, I'm really fortunate to have a, a great team. Um, 
but uh yeah it's a it's an ongoing uh journey of really trying to be a good role model for them as much as i've had great role models in my life as well well you're doing extraordinary things there what, what do you love about what you do um I still love the chaos of everything. I love that every day is, uh, is you know, is always a surprise. You're always going to have um, challenges and surprises that that need to be overcome. Like one day, you know, you might be on the phone with, with the meat person and you'd be like really waiting on, on all of the protein. And, you know, all of these checkup calls, you might have stoves break down, people call in sick. Like every day is just... Uh, there's always something unexpected every day, which is all part of the fun of, you know, really navigating how to, how to handle everything. Um, and I love that. I love that I'm running around, you know, I love, I love running around. So it sometimes looks like I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a bad time. I have a very serious expression on my face, but I, in, in all honesty, I, anyone who knows me knows that I, I actually just love it. <laughs> Well, uh, I've absolutely loved catching up with you today on Deep in the Weeds. Look forward to seeing what you do from here on, Cameron. Um, please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.